Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this new message. Before we begin, let's once again come before the Lord and commit this time to Him, for it's His Word. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I just pray and ask that you would guide us and lead us through your word this day. Let your Holy Spirit lead us into all truth as we seek you in these last days. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, praise God. Will with you turn with me to the book of Ephesians, please. The book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 10 to verse 18, verses that I'm sure many, if not all of you, will be uh, very familiar. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Let's read together. <coughs> verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praise God for his precious word. <clears throat> and I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have, as I have said, have heard and read and studied these words many times. But I'm going to focus today on really on the words in verse 16 and 17. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I've called this message today, The Sword and the Shield. And for obvious reasons, we're going to be studying two pieces, the shield and the sword. So let's begin together. Now the Apostle Paul's description of the armour of God is one which has been, as I've said, much studied and also preached about. In fact, as many of you who listen regularly to my sermons will know, it has been a subject much mentioned by me as well. Nevertheless, brethren, I bring it once again to your attention because it holds vital information for every believer who desires to be found still standing and I repeat still standing at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for his bride. Now, as you will no doubt have gathered by now we'll not be studying the whole armour today we will instead as I said be focusing very much upon the two particular pieces of the armour which I named the sword and the shield. So let us begin. When we think of the word armour, I don't know about you, but 
I generally imagine a metal suit of armour worn by the medieval knight. Remember in all the films, uh, Robin Hood or whatever, or King Arthur and that sort of thing. Big heavy armour riding on a huge horse. However, when we read the Apostle Paul's description of the armour of God, he uses the Greek word panoplia, panoplia which actually means full or complete armour. It includes shield, sword, lance, helmet, greaves and breastplate. The sword and the shield are in fact vital pieces of the whole armour that, that are needed to protect and defend the wearer. The first piece of the two that we're going to study today is the sword, the sword of the Spirit. Now I want you to notice, brethren, first of all, that this sword is not a physical metal sword. We do not, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, go around wielding actual metal swords against the enemy. Paul goes to great pains to explain this in his second letter to the believers in the church in Corinth as follows. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we'll read three verses from verse 3 to verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 3. Let's read together. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He continues to drive, that is the Apostle Paul, continues to drive home this point as he writes the following in our next set of scriptures. That's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 12 that we've already read. It's part of our text today. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Finally, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of his might, put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And here we go. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, the word wrestle in verse 12 is the Greek word palai, palai. And it means to wrestle, like a contest between two people, where each tries to throw the other, and which is decided when the victor is able to hold his opponent down with his hand upon his neck. It's also a term transferred to the Christian's struggle with the power of evil. That's according to the Greek dictionary. Now this description denotes a close hand-to-hand -hand combat, doesn't it? It's not one that's between two armies with a great distance between them, but it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so it is, brethren, but not with physical flesh and blood, man, but rather with the devil. And I can't overemphasize this enough, my brothers and sisters, especially in the days that we live. It's so easy to become frustrated and even angry at people. But we must remember that they are, just as we once were, under the influence of the God of this world. And it's not them that we wrestle with, but the spiritual powers 
behind them. We wrestle rather with the devil, Satan, and his minions, as it were. Nevertheless, my brethren, let's get back to the sword. Now this word sword is the Greek word, and it's a long one, makahira, makahira. And it means a knife for killing animals and cutting flesh, a small sword as distinguished from a large sword, a straight sword for thrusting. Now although in the context of what Paul is saying in our text today, in Ephesians, it will be the shorter sword, a short sword, as his form of reference would have been that as carried by the Roman soldier. Now this short sword was called, in Latin, the gladius, the gladius. And it might sound familiar, that name, the gladius. Now this gladius could be between 50 centimetres and 75 centimetres long. Sharp edged with a very sharp point. And it was mainly for stabbing and slashing, the actions of stabbing and slashing. It wasn't for sword fighting, as we see with the other kind of knight that we spoke about earlier. Now the word gladius, gladius, is where we get the word gladiator. That's why it probably seemed recognisable. Gladius is where we get the word gladiator. Gladiator simply means sword fighter. In the Bible, however, the sword carries another meaning entirely to that which the Roman soldier would have known. The, the word sword or makahira in the New Testament is first found in the following scripture. Turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, and verse 34 to 36. Matthew, chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. Let's begin at verse 34 of Matthew 10. Think not, this is Jesus speaking, think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. I'd like you to underline that scripture, if you would. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. And we'll continue, verse 35. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now I've asked you to underline verse 34 for a reason. Now what Jesus says here in that first verse, verse 34, seems at first sight to be a total variance to what the angels announced would be the result of his birth here in this next scripture in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. I wonder if you remember what the angel declared to the shepherds. Let's read it together. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Underline that last portion. And on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now at first sight, this may seem as a complete contradiction. However, it's not a contradiction, as I hope you will understand. Jesus did in fact come to bring peace, for he is the Prince of Peace. In Hebrew, it's Sar Shalom, Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. That's one of his names, one of his titles. However, 
as a result of the finished work on the cross of Calvary, there will be those who will both reject his peace and therefore be hostile to those who do accept it. And as he says in uh, scripture in Matthew 10, this will even include members of your own family. Now, I'd like you to think back to when you were first saved. You may have come from a, through a saved parents, a saved family. You may not have done. You may be the first one in your family to have been born again. And if that's the case, you will have experienced maybe this hostility at first against what had happened to you, what you were proclaiming had happened to you. You had been born again and you were now filled with the Spirit of God. Light has no fellowship with darkness and so there will be hostility, enmity even. Now this saying by Jesus was not just plucked out of thin air, it was something aired through the Old Testament prophet Micah. As you will see if you'll turn to me to the book of Micah for this scripture reference. We're going to look at Micah chapter 7 verses 5 to 7. Micah chapter 7 verses 5 to 7. Now some people ask why do you always have three or four or five different verses when you're really only looking at one verse in a scripture reference. Well, I do that so that we and the listeners, you the listeners, brothers and sisters, can get that scripture verse that we're looking at in its context. That's the reason why we have several verses of scripture references. Okay, Micah chapter 7 verse 5. Trust you not in a friend, put you not confidence in a guide, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoureth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Now Jesus' words were taken directly from this scripture in Micah. And to put it in simple terms, it is the entrance into this fallen world, which is controlled by Satan. He is the God, small g, of this world, Of the loving, I'll read that again. To put in simple terms, it's the entrance into this world, which is controlled by Satan, of the living God, Jesus, and especially his finished work on Calvary's tree, which has brought about this enmity among those who reject the gospel message. Now, what you might say has this got to do with the sword. Well, if you'll turn back with me to our text for today, you'll see the answer. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. Let's read together. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So then, when you are born again of the Spirit of God, you actually have the living Word, Jesus, within you. However, if you just sit back and rely on this, in the war against the enemy, it will be the same as having a gun, but not having any bullets in it. Or, in fact, a sheath without an actual sword in it. 
because that's what it will be. A sheath without a sword in it. If we don't have the word. When Jesus faced Satan himself in the wilderness, remember that? When he was 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness, after, after that, the, Satan came to, to tempt him, to try him. How did he rebuff? How did Jesus rebuff the tempting by Satan? Yes, he used the word of God against him. This was a clear example of how we, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, are to resist the attacks of the devil, Satan and his minions. Nonetheless, in order to do this, you and I must have a goodly supply of the word of God in our minds and in our hearts. So it can be called upon when the time comes. Yes, the, the Spirit will lead us into all truth. But we need the word first. We do this obviously by daily reading of the word of God. How many of you, brethren, read the word of God daily? Praise God for those who answer in the affirmative. The more we read and study the word of God, the more the Holy Spirit can lead us into the truth within it. And as a result, we become more and more conformed to the likeness of Christ within us. And the more and more the Holy Spirit can draw from that word to prompt us to speak it when we need to. King David knew the importance of knowing the word of God. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. We're going to read just one verse, verse 11. <clears throat> Psalm 119, verse 11. Let's read together. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. I'll read it again. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, listening to this message, I encourage you to write out or type out, print out that verse and put it on your refrigerator or somewhere that you can regularly see it and memorise it. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Now I hope that I can impress upon you, my brothers and sisters, just how important the sword of the Spirit is with regard to our armour. However, it goes hand in hand with the next piece, which we're going to speak about today, which is, of course, the shield. The shield of faith. Now I said that the sword and shield go hand in hand, and this they do. In fact, they go hand in hand, both physically and also spiritually, don't they? You look at the Roman soldier, he has the shield in one hand and the sword in the other. And we too, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, need to be carrying the sword and the shield as you'll see as we continue this study. Now the word shield in our text in Ephesians 6 is actually the Greek word thureos, thureos, which means a large shield as door-shaped. That's the Greek definition of the word thureos, a large shield as door-shaped. And again, as I explained at the beginning of the message, 
the Apostle Paul is using the armour of the then Roman soldiers as a reference for his description in the text we're using today. Therefore, we need to know what a Roman shield looked like in order to understand why faith is our shield. So then briefly, the Roman shield, or the Latin name for it is the scutum, scutum. It weighed about 10 kilograms or 22 pounds. It was a large rectangular shape and curved, convex in shape. It was made basically from three sheets of wood glued together and then covered with canvas and leather. Some, if not many, had metal edges to keep everything together and there was a metal boss in the centre of the shield. Now the leather on the shield, on the outer of the shield, would have been regularly anointed with oil and polished to make it smooth, thus being better able to deflect and even extinguish arrows from the enemy. The dimensions of the shield are roughly as, as follows. The length of it or the height of it would be about 104 to 106 centimetres. Now that in English or Imperial would be about 41 or 42 inches tall. And the width of it across would be about 40 centimetres, which is round about 16 inches. So as you can see, it was large enough to protect the whole body. It was also used to protect, or protect a, a static or advancing group of soldiers. The shields could be brought together in front and at the sides and even also above a group of soldiers in what's known as a phalanx, a phalanx. This was very effective in the Roman army because it allowed an easy advance of a group of soldiers against arrow fire, spears and even rocks and stones without being injured. The, now, the shield of faith is indeed vital for each and every one of us in Christ Jesus, as indeed the shield was to the Roman soldier. What though is faith? But I wanted to mention before we go on, I don't know about you brethren, but looking back at the phalanx, this group of Roman soldiers who used their shields locked together in front and at the sides and above as protection. This sounds very much like a group of committed believers in Christ Jesus, doesn't it? Doesn't it to you? It sounds like a fellowship or a group of true believers in Christ, all having the shields of faith around them to protect them. Now this word faith, we're looking at now at what is faith? What is faith? The word faith in our text is the Greek word pistis, pistis, which is in the Greek dictionary uh, a persuasion, that is a moral conviction of religious truth or truthfulness of God. It's an assurance, a belief in truth. However, the writer of Hebrews puts it more simply. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at a number of scriptures in Hebrews 11. So please keep your finger in Hebrews 11, if you will. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith 
is not only important to us, it's in also important to God. As we see in the next verse from Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11 verse 6. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let me read that again. Hebrews 11, chapter, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, that is God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists, that is. And, he that, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now interestingly, the words diligently seek him are one Greek word. And that word is exateo, exateo. And it means the following, to seek out, to search for, to investigate, to scrutinize. To seek out for oneself, to beg, to crave, to demand back, to require. That's the essence of the word diligently seeking or exateo in this verse in Hebrews 11 verse 6. Now God is a rewarder of them that seek him out, that investigate his work, that scrutinize his word, that beg, that crave understanding, that demand an answer through the Spirit. Now how many of you, brethren, listening to this message can answer honestly that you see, search God's word in such a way? How many of you just read through it quickly as fast as you can through the day? God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. Let's continue. How though does one obtain faith? Now the word of God comes to our aid once again here in this following scripture. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. Let's read together. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In other words, faith comes as we hear the word of God. It appears then that faith for the disciple of Christ means that he or she has absolute confidence that God is whom he says he is and that what he says he will do. He will do. Now when you are first saved, brethren, you believe because of what you both see and feel ex and experience. As you are brought from darkness into light, God is gracious and merciful to a new believer. Things look brighter and word of God truly speaks to you and, and marvellous things may happen in your life as experiences of God's presence in your life. As you continue, as you and I continue in our walk through with Christ, God seems to at times remove the training wheels as it were. He removes his hand just a little. And as a natural father would do, for example, in teaching his child to ride a bicycle. Remember if any of you have small children and you they have their first bicycle they have training wheels don't they 
so that they can't tip over, or it's not easy to tip over. But as they grow and they get more confidence, the training wheels come off. But to begin with, you keep your hand near the saddle or somewhere on the bike, don't you? Just to keep that uh, stability there, that they know you're there. Then as they get more confident, you hold your hand away and leave them to it. Always being close by if you're needed. And this is just how God is with believers in Christ Jesus. God does this so that his child learns to trust in him rather than what he does or in our own strengths and abilities. It's all part, brethren, of growing up in the Lord. Now Abraham and Moses and David, just to name three biblical characters, all had to learn this in their individual walks with God. And so do we. I'm sure that all of you who are saved, excuse me, have received a call or a vision of some kind as to what God may have for you in your life. If you've not yet, I'm sure you will along the way as you seek God. That call may be to preach the word. It may be to teach. It may be missionary work or evangelism or some other uh, area of, of help and aid in the community. However, just as Moses found out, there will be much to learn before you see the fulfilment of that call. Brethren, there is always a period of darkness before God brings you into your particular function in the body of Christ. This period is called the wilderness period. There's no set time period for this wilderness period because only God knows when you and I are ready. Now it took 40 years of tending sheep in the desert before Moses was called back to Egypt by God to bring his people out of captivity. Now I hope and I pray that it won't be that long for you, my brethren, and I'm sure it won't be. A lot will depend upon how well you listen and learn as to how strong your shield is and how sharp your sword is. This, of course, brings us back to the Word of God. And why is that, you might ask? Well, we come back to the Word of God because our knowledge of and trust in God's Word will determine the effectiveness of our sword and our shield. Now, to bring all this together, let's bring this to a conclusion. Now, as you will no doubt gather, as you look at the world around you, my brothers and sisters, darkness is very much on the increase. Even in the last few days, there has been political upheaval. There's pestilence of various kinds globally, not to mention the downright depravity of man in all of its forms and kinds. There's also a growing worldwide hostility and antagonism against true and professing Christians, true and professing believers in Christ Jesus, which should not really come as any surprise to anyone who knows and understands the prophetic word of God, especially that concerning the last days. Consequently, my brethren, the days are coming, and for some in this world they are already here, where 
anyone who would desire to boldly stand for Christ will most definitely need to be fully equipped with the armour of God. The letter to the Ephesians is believed to have been a circular letter meant to be read out in churches around Asia. There were maybe many copies of this letter. It's not uh, presented in its wording to any particular church. But it's believed that this particular copy survived and was added to the canon of Scripture. It was written by the Apostle Paul. It is believed while he was imprisoned in Rome. His death coming between 64 and 68 AD, it's believed. It is then some of the last words to be written by him before his martyrdom, there in Rome at the hands of the Romans. They should then be taken very seriously. They were meant to be taken seriously by the believers in Ephesus. And they are meant to be taken seriously by you today. You and I today, do you agree? These God-inspired warning words came just prior to the events that would happen in Jerusalem in 70 AD. That of course being the sacking of the city and the destruction of its temple. There was also widespread persecution of Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Paul knew that the believers would need this whole armour of God. Does anyone really believe that conditions will be any easier for true believers in the days leading up to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in our day? This, dear brethren, is why I am focusing upon these two particular pieces of the armour today because the sword and the shield will expose either the strength or the lack of faith in the word of God in each and every believer. What do I mean by this? Well, as I said earlier, both of them are inextricably linked. The sword as the text tells us, is the word of God. And as such, there must be a serious belief in the following, as we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I'm going to read it again. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, how do we seek him, brethren? We seek him through his word and through prayer. There will never be a serious faith in the word of God unless there is first an unshakable faith in the God of the word. Do you truly believe that God exists and that he intervenes in the affairs of man? This is a question that only you can answer truthfully and honestly from your heart individually before God for God already knows brethren the truth of the matter because God knows your heart and he knows my heart. This is why I believe Paul says in our text in verse 16 of Ephesians 6 above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Above all, taking the shield of faith. I'd like you to underline those few words. Above all, taking the shield of faith. The emphasis here by Paul of the words above all shows us the importance of true and unshakable faith, both in God and in his word. The word above is the Greek word epi, which means upon or before, over or against. In position, 
first in position. The word all is simply the word, Greek word pas, which means individually, singly, or collectively, some of all types. So then, brethren, I hope that you can clearly see and understand that Paul is saying in those few words that first and foremost importance belongs to faith. My dear brothers and sisters, we must understand that we are indeed living in the last of the last days. I hope you understand that and that you believe it. Therefore, if you and I do not have an unshakable faith in Almighty God, there's absolutely no way that we will be able to withstand, let alone stand in the fierceness of the anger that will be unleashed upon the disciples of the Lord Jesus in the days leading up to his return by the enemy, which is Satan. We all have our weaknesses, brethren, and it is no use denying the fact. However, if we have that unshakable faith as a shield that God is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, then just like the Roman soldier, we can trust the protection that that shield will provide. As Paul himself said, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. My dear brethren, in the days that we live, which mirror those just prior to the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, please let us not take the inspired word of God lightly. Let us rather make it our mission to do as the Apostle Peter says in the following scripture. Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now let me ask you, how is your faith today, my brother? How is it when things don't go the way you might want them to go? So if you are prone to anger and so on, when things don't go as you like, then thrust yourself back into the word of God and strengthen your faith and trust in him and his word. Do not forget the promise to you. As the final scripture, I leave with you. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. Thou, that is God, will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trusteth ye in the Lord for ever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Until next time, my brethren, may your armour be strong. May God richly bless and keep you. Amen.